All right, so yeah, so my name is Bad Sector. Um, I am alumni of Monash and Monsec. I uh, graduated in 2018. And yeah, today I work as a penetration tester at IPSec, which is actually a, uh, a company that's near Monash, uh, Notting Hill. Um, and we do pen testing, things like that. Uh, for today, I'll be talking to you about uh, the Linux heap. Uh, specifically a exploitation technique known as the house of force. Um, but I'll briefly touch on like the basics of what the heap is, uh, why it's used and how it works. And then we'll get into some exploits. Um, there's some prerequisites that hopefully I can change the slide with, yep. Um, so there's some prerequisites if you'd like to follow along and do the challenges. Uh, the whole, like, everything about this talk is in this repo, which I've linked in Discord uh, in the workshop channel. And, um, yeah, so basically what you need is a Linux distro of your choice. So I tested this on Kali Linux and it seems to work fine. Uh, you need GDB, so GNU Debugger, Python 3, and the two probably most important things that you need is Pwn Tools, which is a Python library for exploit development, and um, Pwn Debug, which is, um, I guess, the GDB version of that. So it allows you to develop exploits easier and reverse engineer stuff. Uh, it's good stuff. So you should get that. Um, yeah. So just to clear up a misconception uh, with the heap, so during my time uh, studying computer science and IT, uh, I've come across two different heaps, and I guess it's something that can that can confuse a lot of people. So there is the data structure heap, which is on the right, uh, which you might see in your computer science classes, and there's the memory allocation type of heap, which is on the left. So we're talking about the memory allocation one and not the data structure. So what is the heap, right? Um, so the heap is just space and memory for developers to create objects dynamically. So what that basically means is that you don't need to know the size of the object uh, when you're writing the program and when you're compiling the program. So basically, if you think about any program that takes in an arbitrary sized um, user data, uh, they probably use the heap because as the user is like typing the data in, um, say, for example, Word, um, just like an arbitrary example. Um, as the user types the data in, uh, Word would be allocating objects on the heap to store the text that the user is typing in. Uh, so you would have heard of another section in the memory known as the stack, which is at the bottom over there. Um, so the stack is another area where developers can store uh, variables and objects. But the difference between the heap and the stack is that the stack is mainly meant for local variables. So variables that are created within a function. And so it's not really used once the function leaves. Uh, the benefit with the heap is that you can create the object that you want in the heap. And um, when you're out of the function, as long as you keep track of that pointer to that object in the heap, you can continue using that object in multiple functions. Um, a good analogy for the heap is kind of like a pin board. So if you think about a pin board, you can write, uh, stick multiple pieces of paper on a pin board anywhere you want and reference it wherever you like. Um, yeah, so let's dig into like how the heap works, right? So the heap basically as a developer, all you need to worry about is asking for a chunk from the heap. And when you're done with that chunk, you free it, basically saying that um, you know, you're done with that piece of um, memory and you want to relinquish that resource back to the system so that um, you know, the system's not the program's not hogging memory that it doesn't need. Um, so the pictures below is the actual output in memory, colorized to show um, where the chunks are. So there's two chunks in this output the blue one and the purple one. And basically I've just shown that same diagram on the right hand side. So how do you use the heap in a practical sense? So there's two 
functions that you use, there's malloc and free. So malloc, it basically works by, you provide it a size, and what malloc returns is a chunk, a pointer to a chunk that is at least the size that you've given it. So it would maybe a little bit more, but it would be at least the size that you requested. Um, and it would return a pointer, which you can then use to write your data into it, create an object, whatever you want. Um, and once you're done with that chunk, you're supposed to pass it to free so that um, the chunk is relinquished back into the system and you know, we're being efficient with our memory use. So just a practical example of a simple program that I wrote that uses the heap. So all this does is just creates four different chunks, A, B, C, and D, and it just frees them in, a, in order, A, B, C, and D. Um, so the, the picture that you see on the right, uh, I've essentially used a debugger and stopped the program right before um, they started calling free and I just typed in the viz command in pwn debug. And what that shows you is the heap in a very nice colorful way. And you can see each of the chunks that, that was created. So um, let's take a closer look at one of these chunks, right? So this is gonna be key to our exploit development. So the pointer that malloc returns is not actually the start of the heap chunk. So I have a diagram over here. So this yellow arrow points to the address where malloc will return. So malloc, when you call for the first chunk, will return a pointer of 0x4050010. That's over there. That points to this value here. But the actual start of the chunk is 16 bytes before, which is over here. So that's essentially what I'm trying to show over here by saying chunk start is equal to pointer minus 16 or 0x10. So the actual value that's stored at this address over here, the red block, is a reserved uh, value called prev size, which is not relevant today. It refers to a certain size of chunk that's been freed. Uh, there is some additional processing that malloc can free do. Uh, which is not relevant today, but just know that that is why the chunk starts over here. It's just to keep it consistent with the structure of the chunk, et cetera. Um, just know that it's reserved and the whole eight bytes is reserved for that. Um, the next eight bytes after the start of the chunk is the size field of the chunk. So this is the size of the chunk. Um, right now it says 0x31, but What's important to note is that the three least significant bits of the size field are flags. So they don't actually contribute to the size at all. So in this case, what you have to do is completely ignore the first nibble. So the first hexadecimal character, you have to completely ignore it and make sure it's zero, all right? So what that means is the size of this chunk is not 0x31, it's 0x30. Um, yeah. So Another thing to know is that the size will always be in multiples of 16. And the reason for this is because we're ignoring the first nibble. So um, we're always only incrementing from here onwards, ignoring the first nibble. So it goes 0x3, then 4, 5, 6, and so on. It's always 0 over here. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, that's pretty much it. So if you, if, you, if you ever wanted to find the true size of a chunk, you get the size and you do a bitwise AND operation with this value over here. And all that does, it just drops the first nibble to zero and uh, you get the true size. Another thing uh, to note is that over here, I've called malloc with size 0x28, but we can see in this picture, the size is actually 0x30. So the reason for that, if we look in the bigger version, uh, is because the size field actually counts um, the size as well. So the size field is another eight bytes. So if we count over here, we have 0x8, then we have 0x10, then 0x18, 0x20, 0x21, 0x28, which is exactly what we requested. But then we have to also add in an additional eight bytes for the size. So 0x28 plus 8 is 0x30. So that's the reason why the size is 0x30 and not 0x28. 
Okay, so in this picture, you may have noticed that there's something called top chunk at the bottom over here. So this is gonna be key for our exploit technique. So if you think about the heap, kind of like a pizza, you can say that the top chunk is the whole pizza. And every single time you request for a chunk in the heap using malloc, it's taking away slices of that pizza away. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that each chunk that you request is actually a piece of the chop chunk that's been reserved. Um, so I uh, have an animation kind of thing over here. So this is the first time I call malloc. The first time I call malloc, you see the first chunk has been created, the blue, and we see the top chunk over here. Um, the ch top chunk in and of itself is a chunk. So you can see the size field for the top chunk. And based on what I've talked about before, um, the, the start of the top chunk is over there. Okay, so if I allocate another chunk, you can see that the top chunk size has been reduced. And essentially this chunk came, this purple chunk came from the top chunk again and again. So basically it's just taking pieces away from the top chunk. So I have a, I have a, I have a little demo here um, showing the operation of the heap. Oops. There you go. Can everyone clearly see that? I hope so. All right. Yeah. All right. So this is a simple program. It's exact. It's the exact same program that I made earlier. So all it does is it creates various objects in the heap, and it uses printf to print out the address of those chunks, um, and then it frees them. So we can use GDB to run run this in a debugger, and we can type in start to start the program. So start is a command that's unique to Pwn debug. It's not a GDB command, but it essentially enters into the main function and we can begin debugging the program. So we can see the source code over here and we can see that we're about to call malloc for the first time. So before um, malloc gets called, we've never used the heap before. So the heap doesn't exist in the process memory space. But as soon as I hit next, malloc has been called. And if I look at the process memory space, we see, we see that there's a heap now. Now, Pwn debug has a command called viz heap chunks, but you can just type in viz. If you hit enter, you can see the, the output of the heap in a very colorful diagram. So you can see that the first chunk has been created and this chunk was size, uh, we requested a size of 0x28 but the size that we get is 0x30. Um, the start of the chunk is over here. And now, as soon as I run this printf command, you can see that the pointer that malloc returned. So this is the output of Mal um, the printf, and this is the pointer that malloc returned, 0x405010. So if I type in viz again, you can see that 0x405010, it's pointing to this address over here. Now, using the rules that I've shown before, we know that the chunk actually starts here. So I guess what I'm trying to show you there is that the user data, the, the place where malloc expects you to start writing your data is 16 bytes ahead of where the chunk actually begins. And the rest of the program pretty much shows the same thing. Um, just as an example, uh, malloc returned for the second chunk, 0x4050040. If we look at the heap, 0x4050040 is over here, and the chunk actually starts here. So that's pretty much it for the first hour. Okay, so is there any questions about the heap um, in general that I can answer? Let me see if there's any questions in Discord. Or do people still ask on Discord? I don't think there's any questions, so I'll move on. Okay, so let's begin the exploitation. So the technique we'll be talking today is about is, um, house of force. So that's what it's called. And it's an arbitrary write primitive. 
So what that basically means is using the house of fours, it's like a technique that achieves the ability to write anything that you want anywhere in memory. Um, so obviously this is dangerous because if you allow an attacker to write any value you want in memory, you can start overwriting all sorts of pointers, things like that, and that would change the behavior of the program. And in the worst case, you change the behavior of the program in a way that the attacker gets control of the program, um, which in turn allows them to potentially take control of your server, wh whatever is running the program. So the way the house of force works is by having some method such as a buffer overflow or some other method, just being able to overwrite the top chunk size field to a very big number. So when that happens, you're essentially tricking malloc into thinking that the heap is massive and that it covers the entire process memory space, even beyond the actual uh, boundary in memory where the heap actually ends. Um, so the reason why this exists is because there, it, there was a lack of checks in glibc versions before 2.29. Um, but in version 2.29, they have actually introduced a sanity check for the top chunk size. And um, in version 2.30, they've introduced a max allocation size. So ever since 2.29, this technique is no longer used because it doesn't work. Um, but everything before 2.29, it still works. So if you've found a vulnerability that allows you to do house of force and it's um, it's not working in your computer. Uh, I would still consider that a valid vulnerability because um, you know that program could be running on older systems that use glibc 2.28 or anything below, um, or you know IoT devices that may not necessarily get updates for their glibc. So all of those are still vulnerable, and you can exploit them. Um, so the two conditions that you need for House of Force, yeah, well, of course, you need to have version of glibc before 2.29, but you also need to know where exactly in memory the top chunk is. So you need to know where the top chunk is in memory, so you need to have the exact memory address. And you would also need to be able to overwrite the top chunk size field. So you need to have an overflow that goes far enough to overwrite the top chunk size field. As long as you have those two conditions, you can do the House of Force. In general, the technique um, at, at a high level, the technique is actually quite simple. All you do is you overwrite the top chunk size field to be a massive number. So 0x, f, 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 f. So the biggest possible 16-bit uh, unsigned integer. Um, and basically what that does is the next time you call malloc, malloc will look at the top chunk size and um, you know, in order to get the slice from the top chunk, and it would think that the size of the heap actually covers the entire process memory space. Because we've tricked malloc into thinking the actual top chunk size field is massive. Um, so what that means is now you can allocate a chunk that's large enough to move the start of the top chunk close to a target memory address that you want to overwrite. So we'll have an animation showing that. And then once you've done that, you can call malloc again and this chunk will be large enough to overlap your target pointer. And with that, if you can write into that fourth chunk or, or the chunk that you created in step three, um, you can start overwriting your target address. So here's a little animation, right? So this, this over here is like your whole process's memory. So you got the heap, library, stack, program memory, et cetera. Uh, and then this is just like a zoomed in version of the heap. So there's two chunks already been created. And now let's suppose that there's a buffer overflow in chunk two, right? So you're writing your data into chunk two. It's like going, 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 but then it doesn't stop, right? It doesn't stop once chunk two is over. It keeps going and you start overwriting into the top chunk. So let's suppose we do step two with this technique, right? we overwrite the top chunk size field to be 0x FFFFF. And what that does in turn is it turns like, it tricks malloc into thinking that the entire process memory space is part of top chunk. And so 
it thinks that this whole space is free for it to malloc. So then we do step two, um, which is to allocate a chunk, so a third chunk, that's large enough to bring the start of top chunk close to our target memory address. So over here, so top chunk is there, but then we allocate a new chunk that wraps around the memory space. So starting from here, goes all the way down, but because of then integer overflow, it comes back around and it stops here, which is close to our target address. Then step three is where you've pwned them. So you create chunk four, which overlaps the target address. And if you're able to start writing into chunk four, you'll eventually start overwriting chunk, the, the target. So I have a demo um, showing this exploit. So let's go into one. So I have a template for the exploit as well. So I'll create a template. But before that, I just want to show you the program. Um, I have to make it first or type in make. And then I'll run the program. So it's just a program asking, are you elite yet? And by default, it just says, nope, try again. And the program itself allows you to create a note. So you type in one, it asks you, how big is your note? Um, let's do zero x two eight. Uh, begin writing the note. You can type in whatever you want. And it creates a note. And you can delete notes and exit notes, uh, exit the program as well. Um, I'll show you the code for this program. So main.c. Uh, we'll go to the bottom where main is. All right, so all this program is doing, it's just stuck in a loop and it's prompting you to select an option. Uh, it's first prompting the help function. So let's go up to the help function here. And we can see that it's asking, are you elite yet over here? So this is the function that's prompting that bit of text. And then in this, we can see that there's a conditional saying, if leet, then print, yep, you're leet. Um, otherwise say, nope, try again. So that's this is the output that we see in the program when we run it. So we can look at where this leet variable is being declared. And we can see that it's a global variable because it's being defined outside of a function. Um, by default, it's set to zero. And if you look at any other references to the leet function, we can see that there are none. Uh, sorry, the leet variable, you can see that there are none. Um, so what this means is this variable will always be zero and you will never be leet um, unless you exploit the program. So we can split this window and have a closer look. So this program allows us to create notes. So if we look at this create note function, we can see that it asks how big is your note in bytes. So let's type that in. And it essentially prompts us for the size. And the size is being directly passed into malloc. So we can do this in Vim so we can see all the instances of size. And you can see size is being directly passed into malloc. So if I type in a size of 0x28, we know that malloc has been called and a, and a chunk of size 0x30 um, has been created. If you go further down, we can see that there's a conditional here that says if the size is greater than zero, you're gonna add 16 to the size. And then if we go even further down, we can see that this is being directly given to the read function. It's reading from standard input and it's writing into our note chunk. So over here, we can clearly see that there's a buffer overflow because we've only requested for a 0x28 in malloc over here. But in uh, when you're passing it to read, you're actually adding 16 bytes before you're passing it to read. So we have a 16 byte overflow. So we can check this out in GDB. So if I do GDB a dot out, and I can run the program. So pressing R in GDB will run the program and it would run the program basically. So it's asking, are you lead? Nope, try again. So I can create a note, uh, size 0x28, and just type in a bunch of A's. I can hit Control C when I'm done. 
And if I type in viz to visualize the heap chunks, let me make it a bit better. So you can see that the chunk's been created and our data has started to be written into the chunk. So you got 0x41441 all the way through, but we know that there's a 16 byte overflow. So let's try and overwrite the, the top chunk size. So if I hit continue, um, I can create a new node, size 0x28, and let's do Bs this time. So let's just spam a bunch of Bs in and hit control C. Now, if I type in viz, you can see that the top chunk is over here now, but you can see that the, the size field has been changed into 0x424242, which is the Bs that we just wrote. I can continue the program and it would work as normal. So if I create another chunk, size 0x28, uh, type in whatever I want, I can do viz. And you can see that this chunk has been created and you know, malloc still continues as normal. Even It even reduces the size of the top chunk size, thinking that it's a valid size and it just continues as normal. So that's the bug that we need to exploit. So we can use our um, knowledge of the house of force to begin writing the exploit. So the first step is to perform the overflow into the top chunk size field. So we're going to use Pwn tools and Python to automate this entire process so that we can uh, write raw data bytes into the buffer. So the first thing that I've done is import Pwn tools. Um, we don't actually need structs. Uh, and I've created two functions that act as like functionality of the application because we know that we can create nodes in the application and we can also delete nodes in the application. And essentially all I've done is just make, make it so that you can provide it a size for the note and the note value and it would just create it in the program. Next, what I've done is I've passed the program itself to Pwn tools using this elf object creation. And what that does is it allows Pwn tools to parse the executable program and pull out any variables that we need. So if you remember the, the code for the, um, the vulnerable program, uh, oh yeah, because I have it open here. Uh, yep. Okay, so if you remember the code for the vulnerable program, uh, you know that there is a variable called leet that's being checked. So by passing this binary to Pwn tools, we're able to easily pull out the address of this variable instead of looking for it ourselves. So that's really the only reason why I have that object. The next thing that I create is a process object. So that essentially starts the program and provides an object for us to communicate with the program in the code. So let's begin writing our exploit. So what we can do is we can create our node. So call the create node function, passing in the process connection. And for the size, I'm gonna pass in 0x28, like I've been doing all this time. Next, we can do a padding of A's and fill it with 0x28 A's because we know that the chunk is at least 0x28 in size. Next, I can add uh, a bunch of B's which is 0x8 in size, basically a quad word length in size. I can save this and I can run the program, but I don't want to run it right now. What I, what I can do is I can, instead of using it to run as a process, I can use it to run it in GDB. So this thing that I've commented out would allow you to run the program in GDB. And what I can do is I can just run the exploit and if I leave the full screen mode, I have GDB open and I can essentially start communicating with the program. So I can hit continue in GDB and the program would have run with the exploit and I can hit control C and do viz to visualize the heap. And you can see that we've managed to create a chunk, filled it with 0x4141141 but then in the top chunk size field, we managed to do 424242. 
So this is just like your buffer overflow that we've done before. What that means is you can control the the top chunk size just by modifying this value over here. So what we want to overwrite it with is the largest possible 16-bit unsigned integers. So p64, 0x, ff, 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 ff. So that should be an eight byte integer. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the reason why I'm using P64 uh, is because we want to send the raw binary values rather than just a string of 0x FFFF. Uh, and P64 helps me do that. So it converts this integer into the raw binary value. Now, if I save it and run the exploit again, uh, make it a bit bigger. Okay, hit continue. Control C, then viz. And you can see that we've managed to overwrite the top chunk size field with 0x FFFFFFFF. So this step one is complete, but now we need to do step two. So to do step two, we need to actually calculate the size of the, the chunk, the chunk three in this example. So there's, an, uh, there's a formula for that. And in this slide, I've shown like how you can arrive at it. But basically what it is, is um, you have the target address that you want to overwrite. You have to take that value, subtract it with the current top size, uh, the current top, um, the current top chunk address, and subtract that with 32. So target minus top, current top minus 32. Um, so if you have a closer look at the program when it runs. So suppose we create an arc and make it size 0x28. We can write whatever we want. But then the program actually returns the memory address of the chunk that we just created. So we can use this um, leak of information in Pwn tools to figure out where the top chunk is. So to do that, we can create a variable A and do con.read line. Okay, so we can run this. And when it runs, uh, oh, actually, um, let me print it out because it's not useful if you can't see what it is. So I'm going to print out the variable A that I just created from the program. Hit continue. And you can see this is the printed uh, output. So what it's done is it's reading the program's output and it's read a single line from it and it sees that uh, we, we see the output that we want, right? So we have the location of where our first chunk is. So using a bit of string processing in Python, we can extract this value. So to do that, um, what you can do, we can see that the string is split with spaces. So we can call the split function in Python. So we can do readline.split and we can split with the space character. So now that should create an array for us with all the, the words, so to speak, in that string. So if I continue, there is a bug. I know what the bug is. It's because I'm using Python 3 and Python 3, you need to explicitly say that you're using binary strings. So fix that by using the B character and run the program again. Continue. And something's wrong. I think we run it again. Not helping. I think that it's because it there's like a bit of a race because I used to run in this, into this pro problem when I was building this binary for the talk. 
but it's not fixing itself. Huh. Let's do a bit of debugging on the spot. Okay, so it's happy with the without the split. So if I do a dot split with the binary string space, and then print b. Let's see if that works. Yeah, okay, so I, I don't know why it does that, but um, yeah, so this is a string that we got and then we split it based on spaces and we got an array of binary strings with each of the words of the string. So then what we can do is we, because if you look at the, the array again, if you look at the array again, we see that the, the value that we care about is always in the last position in this array. So what we can do is access um, the last values. So doing minus one indexing. And now if we print B again, we should get the number that we want. Yep, there you go. So that's the number, but it's still in string format. And I wanna get rid of this new line as well. So what I'm gonna do is um, do strip, call the strip function to remove the new line. And I'm gonna wrap this whole thing in the int function to convert the string version of the number into an actual Python number. Because it's a hexadecimal number, I need to spe specify to Python that it's in base 16. So I save that and run the program. Continue, and we can see that this time it actually outputted a number. So this is the decimal representation of this number. So we're good to go. Uh, instead of calling it B, I'm going to call it um, top chunk. Or actually, to be consistent with the slides, I'm going to do current top. Oh, actually, no, it, it's not the top chunk. It's the it's the first chunk that we created. So chunk one PTR. So we know, because that because if we look at the source code for the program again, uh, in the create node function, so it calls malloc and returns, it saves the pointer that malloc returns into the node function, uh, into the node variable. And then what it's doing is, um, yeah, over here. So it's it's just printing the address that malloc returns. So it's not where the chunk starts. It's not where top chunk starts. It's the pointer that malloc returned. So I'm calling that chunk one pointer. And if we go back to our slides um, where I talked about, you know, how where various things in the chunk are positioned. So like over here, we know that the start of the chunk is the pointer that malloc returns minus 16. So what we can do is to get the start of the first chunk, chunk we can do start or chunk one start is equal to chunk one pointer minus 16 or 0x10. Okay, so now we can find out where the top chunk is, right? Because we, we know that there's only one chunk in the heap. Because um, if I run this in GDB again, hit continue, do viz, uh, make it a bit bigger. We can see that there's only one chunk, this blue one here. Uh, we know where this is. So we've managed to figure out where this pointer is and all we did was subtract 16 from it. So we know where this chunk starts. Now, in order to find out where the top chunk is, all we have to do is add the size of this chunk. And because we've said that we're looking for a Xerox two eight size chunk, uh, we just add the other eight bytes and we get size Xerox three zero. And with that, 
we can find out where the top chunk is. So if we do current top is equal to chunk one start plus zero x three zero. Because we requested a chunk of size zero x two eight, we know that there is an overhead of eight bytes. So you're adding another eight bytes, which makes it zero x three zero. We figured out where the start of the chunk is. So that in order to get to the end of the chunk, which is exactly where the top chunk is, we add 0x30 to the start of the chunk. Okay, cool. So now we know where the top chunk is and we're essentially ready to find out how to do um, the allocation. So going back to the slides, um, jumping ahead to where I was. So we're basically doing step two now. So we need to create that green chunk, the blue, the the chunk number three. So that's essentially what we're trying to create so that the, the start of the top chunk gets closer to the target. Okay, so we use this formula to calculate the size that we need to provide to malloc to create the step two chunk. So step to chunk size, actually I'll do a bit of space here. So step two chunk size is equal to the target, which is the lead variable. You can access this in Pwn tools using binary.sim.lead. So that finds the address of the lead variable. You don't have to go looking for it yourself. Um, and then you subtract that with uh, the current top address and you subtract that with 32. Now we're free to create the bridging chunk. So we do create note con, and then we provide the size that we just calculated then. And then for the contents of this note, it doesn't really matter uh, as long as you put something in because the program expects you to type something in. Cool, so now if I save and run this program, we can hit continue and hit control C once it's done running and do viz. And you can see that the, the output of viz is a massive thing and it's no longer making any sense. Um, so, what that means is that we've basically managed to trick Malik into moving the top chunk close to our target address. So if we go back to the slides, basically what that means is we've managed to do this step here, which is creating the green chunk. So now the start of top chunk is very close to our target. It's nowhere near the heap, which is why it looks a bit wonky in the, in the output over here. So what that means is we can move on to step three. So step three, all we have to do is create another note or another chunk. And this one, we'll just make it 0x28. And whatever we write into this note will be overriding the value of lead. So we can fill it with a bunch of A's. So let's fill it with eight A's. And we can run the program. So this time when I run the program, it says, yep, you're late. Um, and if I output the value of the lead variable in GDB, you can see that it's no longer zero. It's uh, some large value. Um, I can examine it in hexadecimal format. Uh, well, I mean, you can see where it's going. So you can see that the lead variable has been turned into our A's. And the reason for this is because in the code, whatever we write into this step three chunk is overriding the lead variable. So that's essentially what's happened here. So we've created the red chunk here and we've essentially started writing into it, which starts overriding the target. Okay, uh, just a visualization as to like why you need this calculation. Uh, we know where the target is. 
uh, we know where the current top chunk is. And essentially all we're doing is using what we know and you know, we know what each of these fields are and we know how big they're, we know how big they are. And we can just do some algebra to move things around and eventually figure out uh, that this formula uh, can be used to move the top chunk to the blue area. That's where we want it to be like that. So we create the green chunk in step two. And what that makes, what that have, what that does is move the top chunk to the blue area from this to this. And then step three is to actually create the fourth chunk and begin overriding the target. So there are some challenges, uh, which I'm thinking on is not accessible yet, but I will make it accessible very soon. Um, it should be in your CTFD, uh, ctf.monsec.io uh, if you want to try it. Uh, most of the challenges are just trivia stuff, just to make sure that you understand like what the heap is and how it looks and where things are in the heap. And there is one challenge that is pretty much identical to the one I just showed you here. But instead of overwriting um, a pointless variable called lead, uh, you'd be overwriting a function pointer. And with that function pointer overwritten, you can hopefully get control of the server that's hosting that program and um, get the flag. All right. Um, so if you'd like additional resources, uh, this slide is available in that GitHub repository. So you can click on this link click on these links and they provide uh, more information about heap exploitation. Uh, I strongly recommend like this guy's course. Uh, you don't have to take it like because there's free information everywhere. Uh, but he presents it in a very clean and un understandable way. Um, and it's not too expensive if it's your first time on Udemy. So I highly recommend you take it. Um, other than that, I'm pretty much done with the talk and I'm ready to answer any questions or help people out with the CTF. Uh, yep, I believe there was one question on Zoom. Uh, okay, let me figure out how to open it. Or do you want to just read it? Oh, uh, yeah, I can just, uh, uh. where's it gone? Yeah, I can't figure yeah. out how to... Is there an easy way to detect which glibc version is running on a device? Right. Uh, so assuming that you have control... Oh, God. Zoom is acting weird. Um, assuming that you have control of the, of the system that you're trying to attack, uh, you should be able to go into... Uh, yeah, so basically the libc would be stored under slash lib. And if you run the libc binary, it should spit out the version. So in this case, my Kali is running glibc 2.31.12. Um, but yeah, that's basically how you can figure out the libc version. Uh, but if you don't have access to the remote system and your target is, I mean, you, you're not sure what version of libc they're running, uh, what you'd need to do, it's a bit out of scope for this talk, but what you need to do is leak several addresses within the libc library in memory. And you can use a site, um, some of my bookmarks, uh, if I can flip over to this side, I'll just create a new window. So libc, I think it's this one. Yeah, so basically what you do is you figure out various uh, addresses within the libc library in memory of the program as you're exploiting it. And you type it in into this query and you hit search. And it should give you some ideas about what version of libc might be running on the target. And you can download the libc and build your exploit around that. So that's kind of how you figure out what version of libc runs on the target. <clears throat> 